I'm here to model for the medieval artists. Oh, I think you might actually be in the wrong place. The pre-Raphaelite artists are down the hall. But I'm, I'm in med medieval clothes and everything. You're wearing what? I've never seen a dress like that. I have. But where on earth is your kirtle? You're missing all your underlayers. And what is your hair doing loose? I guess maybe someone's painting a romantic heroine, but really you shouldn't be coming in here like that. But, but I tried so hard! Uh, okay, honey, okay, okay. Come over this way. Don't worry, you're gonna be just perfect for whatever Waterhouse is working on. We've all seen these paintings somewhere. Maybe you've even seen a few of them in my previous videos. The Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood was a 19th century arts movement with a strong interest in history, albeit with a very Victorian set of ideals about what parts of it they wanted to depict. These dramatic, romantic medieval scenes have stuck very solidly in Western cultural imagination, and you can easily see why. But do they have anything at all to do with actual medieval clothing? Hi, I'm V, fashion historian who is not about to let my lack of an art history education stop me from talking about what I do actually know, that being old clothes. I can't give you a detailed history of the entire pre-Raphaelite movement's impact on art, but I can absolutely get into why these medieval-esque outfits are the way they are and why we find them so memorable. By the way, I want to thank everyone who wished me good health in my last video's comments. I am well and truly over the lung infection, thank goodness. But unfortunately, I cannot seem to catch a break. <laughs> I had one of my regularly scheduled medical crises over New Year's, and I also just broke a nearly four-year streak of never having had COVID. Get your vaccinations and cover your snoots, people. There's a surge on. My doctors put me on Paxlovid right away, so I've recovered fast, but I will take all the help I can get taking care of my body right now, so I want to thank AG1 for sponsoring this video and making it much easier to keep myself well nourished. AG1 is a daily foundational nutritional supplement that includes vitamins, probiotics, and whole food sourced ingredients to support whole body health. The benefits include everything from gut health to brain health, immune health, and nutrient replenishment. And every batch is NSF certified for sport. If you avoid gluten, lactose, dairy, egg, animal byproducts, peanuts, GMOs, added sugars, and a massive list of pesticides and herbicides, you can drink this. It's best to drink AG1 first thing in the morning, and as someone who struggles a lot with eating breakfast, it's been super helpful for my routine. You mix a scoop of AG1 with eight to 10 ounces of cold water, or juice, or whatever you like. They've improved their formula 52 times, including for taste. It feels like getting that boost of nutrients and hydration right away makes it easier to get breakfast down. It's also really helpful when I'm having a bad day with my fibromyalgia and it's hard to put energy into cooking. I like to keep my eating balanced, but when you're managing chronic pain and fatigue, some days that's just not gonna happen. So it's really helpful to have that baseline level of nutrition. AG1 also includes a daily dose of vitamin C, zinc, functional mushrooms, and more to support immune health. I already have a pretty intense supplement routine to help with my chronic stuff, and there are a lot of things I don't always take because, well, it's too many pills already. Drinking AG1 replaces a few of those, plus gets me a solid dose of a lot of things I haven't been able to work into that routine. Getting that zinc and vitamin C and everything is always a good idea during winter when all sorts of things are going around. Click my link in the description below to get a free one year supply of AG1 vitamin D3 plus K2 plus five AG1 travel packs with your first purchase of AG1. I don't understand why you can't just eat your vegetables like a grown adult. Like a grown adult? Look who's talking. Anyways, were you volunteering to cook said vegetables for me? Yeah, that's what I thought. So a super brief explanation of who the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood were, a group of young artists in the late 1840s wanted to cycle back around to older styles of art, specifically Italian Quattrocento art of the 15th century. They admired the richness and detail and gravitas rather than the proportion and balance and neoclassical influences of the successive art movements. Much of this they blamed on the Renaissance artist Raffaello Sanzio de Urbino, known in English simply as Raphael, hence the name. 
Through the 19th century, the movement expanded to include or influence a sizable number of artists working in mediums from paint to sculpture to textile design and poetry. The initial brotherhood only lasted around five years, but the term stuck to both works of art made with similar ideals in mind, romanticism, medieval or early renaissance influences, richness and gravitas, and to artists who had the connections to the original brotherhood or their circle. A bunch of Victorian artists who built an entire art movement around fantastical scenes definitely took plenty of artistic license. But their depictions of medieval-inspired clothes are, well, a lot cooler looking than actual medieval art. So they end up being a lot more familiar and memorable to most people. One of my favorite actual medieval garments, the Blio, ended up becoming the foundation for a huge number of high fantasy fashions, and I think these paintings were a big step in that journey. Longtime viewers might recognize The Accolade by Edmund Blair Layton, which features a Blio-like fantasy dress and which appeared in the intro of the video where I made my first Blio. Interestingly, it's got the pleated or gathered skirt depicted in the Chartres Cathedral statue that's been the source of intense debate about how Blios were constructed. While we now believe those folds to be an artistic choice the sculptor made trying to translate draping fabric to stonework, it's intriguing to see them show up in art this way. Of course, it's also got puffed upper sleeves as well as the characteristic wide hanging cuffs, and it's hard to tell if the undersleeves are part of the overgown or the undergown we can see at the neckline. The painting shows the knighting of a Polish duke from the early 14th century when blios were well out of fashion. He seemed to really like painting the big sleeves, since they show up in his other works attached to a variety of dresses, ranging from chemises to 14th century style fitted gowns. John William Waterhouse was another who loved painting Blio-like dresses, but they varied a lot. His Ophelia shows a front-closing wide-sleeved gown with a low wide neckline over a kirtle with tight sleeves and the same neckline. It's a mix of the elements that defined 12th and 14th century fashions respectively, the wide sleeves of the Blio over a contrasting kirtle, but the smooth flowing lines and front closure of the 14th century coat hardy. Miranda, painted in 1916, shows almost the exact same outfit, which makes me wonder if it was a real costume that existed, and he used it for two different paintings. His 1888 Lady of Chalot is also very Blio-like, and has many of the same features that Leighton's accolade shows, like the gathered skirt and the undersleeves that may or may not be part of the same dress. Blios are far from the only medieval style that the pre-Raphaelites loved to paint, and they approached other medieval fashions with the same scattershot attitude towards accuracy. Rossetti's The Salutation of Beatrice in 1859 has some pretty solid early medieval clothes. Beatrice wears an unfitted kirtle or dress with no visible closures or shaping. It's about as good a representation of early medieval rectangular cut dresses as we get in, well, early medieval art. I'm less sure about what Dante is dressed in, particularly the collar and the hat. Menswear is not my area. However, we've then got these two figures in the background wearing sleeves split to show puffs underneath, which reminds me very much of Tudor undersleeves. William Holman Hunt's Claudio and Isabella intentionally contrasts 15th century upper class menswear with a nun's habit based on earlier medieval styles. It's a scene from Shakespeare in which the artist is using clothes to establish the characters. We associate flashiness and drama and a very specific flavor of toxic masculinity with the lines of upper class 15th century menswear. And we understand the decadence of the strong colors and fur and rich fabrics. Set against the all white nun's habit worn by Isabella, including the wimple and veil, it does well to establish the emotional impact of the scene, in which Claudio tries to convince his sister to sacrifice her reputation in exchange for his safety. Ford Maddox Brown's King René's Honeymoon is based on a real historical figure, King René of Anjou, and shows the queen in what looks like a Burgundian gown, same neckline and overall shape at least. It's a style that was very much in fashion, 30 years or so later than the wedding of the historical figures whose honeymoon this painting depicts. So a little bit off, but not by too far. And John William Goodward painted a huge number of pieces depicting classical Greek or Roman fashions, ranging from you draped some fabric on a person to you could wear that to an SCA event as long as it wasn't quite as sheer as in that picture. One painting I came across does a good job of summing up the themes of medieval costume in pre-Raphaelite art, the Death of King Arthur by James Archer. 
All four of the female figures in the foreground of this painting wear styles from different eras. And uh, if there are any art historians in the audience who want to jump in and tell me if this was intentional or not, please do, because I want to know. At the far left, we've got a fur-trimmed houppelande, so late 14th or early 15th century. The one in the dark costume, I can't actually tell what's going on there, aside from the fact that the cloak has a closure that was fashionable in the 12th century. The figure leaning against the tree looks much more early medieval, although it could be up to the 13th century or so. Unfitted kirtle with a keyhole neckline and a cloak over it. She could almost be straight out of the Morgan picture bible, just put her hair up. On the far right, there's a decidedly Renaissance outfit with a fitted bodice, a full pleated skirt, and laced on two part sleeves in a different fabric. What we're looking at, with the exception of the black dress, because I can't see what's up with it, is like a greatest hits reel of medieval and early modern Western fashion. All of these styles are very memorable and very picturesque, recorded in art from their originating periods. And this is a scene from Arthurian legend. The Victorians loved their historical fantasy, and just like modern historical fantasy, the vibes and the narrative are often more important to the artist than an accurate reproduction of history. Another thing that shows up frequently in these medieval-ish pre-Raphaelite paintings is hair worn loose or mostly loose. It's super cool looking, very romantic, and definitely suits the style, but is it actually medieval? Well, yes and no. It was pretty unusual for medieval people to wear long hair completely loose because it just wasn't practical. You didn't have running water or modern hair care products. So the best way of keeping hair clean was to keep it braided and or covered, which is what the vast majority of people did throughout the Middle Ages. Styles varied depending on the time period and region. I'll drop a playlist link up there with a few videos that talk more about medieval hair care and styling. However, guess what shows up a ton in medieval artwork? Loose hair! Hair was considered one of a person's most attractive features, and in the way of societal beauty standards, it had a lot to do with class and wealth too. So in art, loose hair didn't necessarily mean this is a true-to-life depiction of how this person would wear their hair. It was a visual trope. For instance, the Codex Menes, an early 14th century anthology of German poetry, shows nearly all the female figures with loose hair, including an abbess who absolutely would not have been wearing her hair loose no matter what other people did. It's also of note that all the female figures have the same hairstyle and hair color, and most wear one of two styles of headwear, a circlet on unmarried women and a frilled fillet and barbet on married ones. This makes me think that the loose hair has more to do with the artist. Either they only knew how to draw one hairstyle, or they made a specific choice to use the same hair for everyone, regardless of how they actually looked. Conversely, medieval depictions of working class women are a lot more likely to show their hair fully covered, such as in the Lutrelsfalter or our beloved meme laundress from the Holcomb Picture Bible. Loose hair in medieval art was more likely to belong to a woman of high status and or a romantic heroine of some kind. By depicting so many of their subjects with dramatic, if unrealistic, loose flowing hair, these pre-Raphaelite paintings are usually following the same pattern. So many of these portraits are depicting fictional, even fantastical scenes. Shakespeare, Arthurian legend, the works of Dante, and others. So whether they knew it or not, they're in keeping with medieval art. The loose hair is about power and romance, not necessarily about realism. All of this medievalism in art didn't stay confined to painting or even to fine art. William Morris, a close associate of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, was an interior and textile designer who had a huge interest in maintaining and reviving pre-industrial material culture. His influence led to the arts and crafts movement, as well as the artistic dress and aesthetic dress styles, which showed up in everything from fine art to wallpapers and contemporary Victorian fashion. Liberties of London was particularly well known for its historically inspired designs, which were most common in expensive casual wear garments like high fashion tea gowns. It was really similar to the modern cottagecore movement for better and for worse. It kept the love of artisanal textiles and historical fashions alive in the face of increasing mass production, but it also romanticized the working class lifestyle while continuing to unfairly exploit their labor. But that's a whole other video, and I'll save my thoughts on William Morris's politics for that. Subscribe if you want to hear an angry leftist rant about the issues with historical cottagecore movements. 
You can see this influence really clearly in, you guessed it, another painting. William Powell Frith's A Private View at the Royal Academy is a scene set in an art gallery, where half the crowd is shown in standard 19th century clothes, and the other half in artistic or aesthetic dress styles. It really highlights the contrast and shows that while these movements were popular and influential and inspiring, they weren't universally adopted by everyone, much like alternative fashion movements today. So. Did the Pre-Raphaelites know they were painting inaccurate depictions of medieval clothes? Possibly. And it's equally possible they did know and didn't care, or they had some limited knowledge. Maybe some thought they knew more than they did. Victorians are good at that. And maybe some were like, well, I know enough to evoke the right vibes, so that's fine. This was a large and loosely connected movement of artists that spanned numerous decades and mediums, had plenty of internal conflict, and might have had different goals for each work. So I don't think we can make a sweeping statement that all the pre-Raphaelites did or did not know they were depicting medieval clothing incorrectly. And they also did get plenty of things right. What we can do is ask the right questions. The more I understand the context of a strong piece of art, the more interesting I find it. Knowing that these inaccurate depictions of medieval clothes aren't fully accurate, that they mix and match from different periods, that they seem primarily concerned with using striking or well-remembered fashions to make an artistic and emotional impact on the audience, then we can look at these paintings and appreciate them for what they are without being misinformed or frustrated by what they are not. And I would bet at least a little money that many of these artists, if we could ask them, would respond to any challenges about the historical accuracy of their paintings by saying, it's art. There's a reason we have all the words we do to differentiate between an image that's meant to accurately depict the past versus an image that's meant to provoke thought and emotion by telling us a story about the past. If the only question we can think of when looking at the costume shown in a piece of artwork like this is, are they accurate? Then I think we're missing the point. What do they remind us of? What do they make us feel? What story are they telling? Why have they become such a source of inspiration that you can't throw a stone in the genre of high fantasy without coming across a bleo-like dress a la Waterhouse? If we dismissed everything that wasn't historically accurate for that reason and no other, we are missing out on so much of what makes art and fashion matter. And I, for one, refuse to miss an opportunity to admire pretty dresses. I'll just do it on appropriate terms. Thanks for joining me as I dip my toe into the world of art history. Tell me about your favorite piece of art that shows historical clothing down in the comments. I know YouTube won't let us post pictures, but we all know how to Google titles and painters, right? While you're there, make sure to tell YouTube you liked what you saw and subscribe for a more fantastical fashion history. You can find me around the internet at Miss Snappy Dragon on Instagram, Facebook, and very occasionally TikTok, plus patreon.com slash Snappy Dragon Studios if you want to read the source notes and come hang out with us on the new Snappy Dragon Discord server. See you next time!